Hey everybody, Jimmy Smith, back again. This time to talk about the news. Um, Michael Chandler, of course, fighting uh, Charles Oliveira, UFC 309 in November. That he's given up on the Conor fight and moved on and is going to do something with his career now. <clears throat> A lot of ways to look at this one. I'm going to try and break them all down, as difficult as that might be. <clears throat> this is a guy who hasn't fought since the Dustin Poirier fight, November 12th, 2022. So it's going to be uh, uh, almost exactly two years since his last fight. 38 years old, 1-3 in three in his last four fights. One of the things Mike has said about this whole Conor situation, no one needs to feel sorry for me. I made a lot of money in that time. I've gotten a lot of recognition and people supporting me and blah, 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 blah. My thought is I don't think a lot of people feel sorry for Michael Chandler. I, I, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Please let me know in the comment section if you disagree. Uh, he bet big on a Conor fight. Big money, big fame, and he crapped out. Didn't happen, which I said from the beginning, I don't believe Conor McGregor's ever going to fight again. Uh, I'll believe it when he gets in the octagon. You can, right up to the weigh-in, I'm going to go, ah, I don't buy it. I'll buy it when it's a done deal. Now, I understand in a lot of ways why he made the deal he made. I get it. Um, but, but part of it is motivated by the fact that I don't believe Michael Chandler has the requisite two wins necessary to get a title shot. Even in a division that's aging out, Justin Gaethje's approaching retirement, Justin Poirier's approaching retirement, Charles Oliveira, how much gas does he have left? Those names that kind of kept the top five in... Um, the UFC at 155 so intriguing and dominant. The guys are getting old. They've had a lot of fights. They're getting long in the tooth. There's going to be some turnover in the next year or so. But the idea that that Mike could have beaten two fighters in a row to get a title shot, I, I don't see that. He hasn't won back-to-back -back fights in the UFC, uh, two and three overall. Like I said, one and three in his last four. So it was either take time off and wait for this huge fight or go back in the meat grinder See if you can win the fights necessary to get a title shot. I don't think he does that. So, you know, it's this idea that, man, he wasted two years of his career. Yeah, but what would he have done in those two years? Meaning he would have had some fights. He would have made some money. But would he have gotten a title shot? Would he have won that title shot if he had gotten it? Uh, my gut tells me no. This guy is 38 years old. And his skill set is comparatively limited. I've talked about this before. But I think it bears repeating in the context of what I'm talking about, which is Michael Chandler is one of those guys, and, and obviously football season started. I'm a big football fan. My Steelers are 2-0, and although we're a garbage team. Um, the idea that I've been able to talk to a few NFL players in my life. I run into a, a couple doing various things. And one of the questions I like to ask is, what's the biggest difference between the, the college game and the pro game? And without exception, I don't think everyone's the variations of this theme. They say defenses are so much better in the NFL than they are in, in college. They're faster. They're smarter. They're stronger. If you're a football fan, college is a high flying game. They score a lot of points. Players are a lot younger. Um, so the idea that you go in the NFL and you think you can do the things you did in college offensively, get that out of your head immediately. That athletic, run-and-gun quarterback who kind of makes it up on the fly and is really fast and just has a great arm can do great things in college. And then they get the NFL, and they don't have the IQ to beat pro defenses run by men who know what they're doing. It's a similar thing with Mike. Mike is almost that really talented, athletic, physical quarterback who makes things happen that has done well for him. In the lead-up to his Bellator career, which is very, very short, and then in Bellator itself, he did well until he hit a certain level of opponent, and then he, he was always 50-50 against those guys. And even in Bellator, the idea that he had a, a really strong right hand, he's really explosive, really athletic, um, excellent wrestler, was an All-American at Mizzou, he could just do things physically other guys couldn't do. But when he started running into veteran guys who were also athletic, who also had, you know, excellent skill sets. Eddie Alvarez, he's 1-1. Ilwell Brooks, he's 0-2. Patricio Pitbull, he's 0-1. It, it, it was always two steps forward, one step back. And 
The problem with Mike is his fight IQ. And I'm not calling Mike stupid, by the way. I'm not, it's not a personal insult. I've, I've spent time around Mike. He's not a dumb guy. It's the idea that he, his fight IQ is very low and that he does the same thing over and over. And when he fought Patricio Pitbull, is a great example where stay away from the guillotine, don't exchange with Pitbull early. That's it. If I were coaching Mike, all I would say is don't take a stupid shot and end up in a guillotine because Pitbull has a great guillotine. And Pitbull can crack at short range. Don't get in a firefight with this guy, especially early on in the fight where he's got all his energy. If you wear him out a bit with his takedowns, takedown defense is good, not great, uh, especially against a guy as, as big as Mike. Wear him down and you can exchange later. What does he do? He goes out there and gets in a firefight with Pitbull early, gets cracked and finished. And there's so many things where, you know, if, if Mike's strategy was as advanced as his athleticism, he'd be undefeated, but it's not. Um, and we're seeing that more and more in the UFC when, you know, he's already in the deep in the deep end of the pool, you know, after knocking out Dan Hooker. You're only going to fight elite guys. Elite guys aren't falling for the blasting overhand right that knocked out everybody when you were, I wouldn't even say in Bellator, you knocked guys out in Bellator until he got to a certain level. They're just not falling for that stuff. And once again, it's the athletic quarterback who's now facing real defenses who know what's coming and, and, and are planning for a long game. And Mike has trouble with that. So when I look at the choice he had, where he wasted two years, and I wouldn't say prime years, I would say maybe at the end, you know, it was already 36, now he's 38. These are not 25 to 27, you know, the prime years. He lost years that if he's lucky, he's still firing on all cylinders. Getting into that, that the, the idea of him aging out. Mike has a style that relies a lot on his physicality, his explosiveness, his speed, all these things. That doesn't necessarily age well. Right? You tend to lose your explosiveness and your speed about the age Mike is now, maybe even a little younger. But he's not a timing guy either. To me, that's number one. Timing goes before anything, which can be a combination of speed and athleticism, depending on your style. But the guys who are really precise and, and have a funky style that requires you hitting at exactly the right time, that goes young. Right? It's, it's just the ability to exactly hit a precise target becomes really difficult as you get a little bit older. Mike's not a precision guy. He has a blasting overhand right, a really hard left hook, good blast double leg. He doesn't rely on a lot of things that 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 are timing based. He doesn't have that. Not Fedor, you know, leans into every punch, and he doesn't really do that. Um, so his style is pretty basic. Basic styles age well, right? Hands up, chin down, good footwork. You can do that until you're 90. Power doesn't tend to go away. Mike has a lot of power. Um, but that explosiveness and athleticism and ability to boom, you know, attack quickly, that can fade. We haven't seen him in two years, so I don't know if it's faded since his last fight. Looked pretty explosive against Dustin Poirier, um, but two years is two years. So we'll see whether any of that lasts. Also, he's taking on Charles Oliveira, a guy who beat him last time. And this is a five-rounder. That is a very important very important uh, uh, aspect of this fight. When he fought Benson Henderson the first time, in round number one, he got a five-point suplex, if you follow amateur wrestling, the arc, and the big throw on on uh, Benson Henderson, suplexed him right over his head. I was calling that fight and went, wow, that was a huge burst of gas for no reason. Suplexes don't really hurt. And Benson Henderson took it fine, and Mike used all this energy, and by round three... He was sucking wind, and he had to hang on in rounds four and five to win a decision because Benson Henderson is a guy who gets stronger as the fight goes on. Mike does not pace himself well at all, even in three-rounders. The way I, I evaluate Mike's abilities and his talents and his, his odds of winning, he has a 50-50 chance to beat any fighter on earth at 155 pounds in the first two rounds of a fight. Past that, and would love to see a statistical analysis of this. I'm kind of a statistics dork, but I'm not that good. Um, the idea that his third round ability to win just falls off a cliff. He's real competitive with anybody in the first two rounds. If you can get past the first two rounds, Mike's ability to win just evaporates. He, he just, when he fought Dustin Poirier and it was tied after two rounds and the odds were even, if I were a betting man, I would have bet my house on Poirier. Oh, the odds are even. No, they're not. 
Dustin Poirier paces himself very, very well and tends to have energy in the third round, and Mike doesn't. And Poirier choked him out. So this is a five-rounder. Now, Charles Oliveira has had similar issues a little bit uh, last time out against Soyukin. He had a, a deep guillotine in round number one, couldn't get it. Had to hang on a little bit in rounds two and three, but he had more energy than Mike typically has. Mike like goes goes to a hundred and then down to twenty miles an hour. He just he, he he can't pace himself at all. So the fact this is a five rounder indicates to me that it's 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 going to be tough for for Mike to come out on top. Obviously, I'll do a, a more significant breakdown as it gets closer. But Mike took two years off. Says, "Don't feel sorry for me." I don't think anyone feels sorry for him. We understand the choice that he made. It didn't work out for him. We understand the choice that he made. It's, we don't feel bad. We just didn't see you fight for two years. And I know you're you're, you're probably financially taken care of. I'm sure the UFC paid him during that two years to, you know, to not fight, essentially. The idea that I was financially okay for two years, I got a bunch of exposure, I'm, you know, I'm doing fine. Sure, is that what you came here to do? be okay and get fans to pay attention to you. It's just nice. Wonderful. Right? Fame is good, especially if it comes with money. But the idea that you just didn't fight for two years, where your prime, once again, at 36, you're lucky to still be fighting at all, and you didn't fight for those two years, and we could see what you had. Of course, the counter-argument is to that, to, to that is I don't think he beats the two guys. I, I think he loses enough that we might have been done with Michael Chandler had he fought consistently in those two years. So that's the other side of it. Would this be a title eliminator? Maybe, depending on the performances of either guy. Once again, 55 is starting to age out. A lot of the big names that, that put butts in seats and sold pay-per-views are just getting older, and, and these are you know, might be the two guys left standing when it's all said and done. Right? Gaethje might have one left. Poirier might have one left. These two guys just might be the only two guys coming off a win that would be ready to fight for a title of that generation. you got to move other guys up, and that's the problem in, in combat sports period, whether it's boxing or MMA, is there's a delay where the stars are aging out, but you don't have that next generation of stars. So... You know, rarely is it a direct line, okay? So right now that next generation is there. They're coming up. Uh, they're not quite billboard material yet, right? Benoit saint had his chance. Poirier beat him. You got to recharge and come back, and we can see if you can be a star. But, you know, blew that opportunity. Um, Islam is a fantastic champion. I think he's a level above everybody else right now. So I'm not worried about him going anywhere. But the idea that 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 next generation has to come up. So a lot of times that last guy standing gets the title shot, right? The last guy of this, this top five that was, that was so dominant and, and so entertaining for so long, those guys are going to get that last opportunity of the title. The way Dustin Poirier did. Got that beat Benoit on the knee and got that last opportunity of the title. Didn't think he had much of a shot, but there is that kind of rocky quality to it. A victorious Michael Chandler. Or Charles Oliveira might have that rocky quality. They one more shot at, at Islam. It's, you know, a rematch, obviously, for Charles. But, you know, maybe Mike does it. But the idea that, that he lost two incredibly vital years, those last sunset years where he might have had a chance in his mid to late 30s to make a run, that's gone. And so you have two years off, one and three in the last four, taking on a guy who is extremely dangerous and beat you last time. Mike's going to have some trouble, I believe. Um, that difficulty of time off and a style that is, in my opinion, very easy to train for and very limited. If I was training Charles Oliveira, watch out for that big right hand, the loopy left. He's probably not going to try and take you down because he really respects your ground game. Get out of the first two rounds and it's yours. I don't care if you walk back to the corner at the end of round number one and it's 10-7 and you got handed. As long as you're alive and functioning, if you can get through the first two rounds, his odds of winning go off a cliff, and that's when you're going to get him. So Mike is just one of those guys who's just too easy to train for. You know, The elite of the elite, Islam Makachev. How do I beat Islam Makachev? You know, he doesn't have a lot of holes in his game. His gas is good. He's well-rounded. He's a good finisher. Big for the weight class. Not easy, okay? There are certain guys who are good 
they're good fighters, but you know they're they have one or two paths to victory, and not it's easier said than done. But at least you can have a game plan that works. Mike is one of those guys. He's powerful. He's strong. He's a good finisher, but he's tactically limited. So we'll see what he can do. But the, with the two years he took off, he took a huge bet. All right, appreciate you. Give me a like, a subscribe, and I'll see you next time.